Okay, so we're going to continue looking at um, vectors. So we're going to look at part two. Okay, so in your packet, it's still the first packet from yesterday. Um, the second packet that I just gave you, that'll be what we do the next two days. Question? All right, so we're going to start off by using that notation that we ended with last time. This is the algebraic way, this is what your book calls it, to write a vector. So rather than drawing it as an arrow, we put these angle brackets. Okay, don't use parentheses. Okay, make sure they are angle brackets. And they have x and y components. So you can think of those as directions. Okay, if you start from the origin, x tells you how far left or right to go. Y tells you how far up or down to go to get to the terminal point. So what does it mean if two vectors are equal? Okay. Well, nu numerically, um, might mean something a little different than what you would think visually. Okay. If I draw this vector, okay, and then I draw uh, this vector, are those vectors drawn in the same spot? No. But where they're drawn has nothing to do with if they are equal. Basically, the idea is, if they started at the same spot, would they end at the same spot and line up right on top of each other and point the same way? If the answer is yes, then they are equal, regardless if they start in different spots. So what it means for two vectors to be equal is the horizontal components are equal and the vertical components are equal. Okay. Meaning from the initial point, you go exactly the same amount left or right, and exactly the same amount up or down for both vectors. And that's the case here. This is right 3, up 3. The other one, if I line it up a little nicer, right 3, up 3. They're both the vector 3, 3. 3, 3. 3, 3. So even though they're in different spots, that's OK. They are equal. Any question on, on that? Okay. So the last way I'm going to show you to write a vector is called unit vector notation. And this is the most common um, way that vectors are written. Okay. Um, we had that word yesterday, unit vector. Um, does anybody remember what that means? If a vector is a unit vector, it means that it is what equals one? It's its direction? Magnitude. It's magnitude. Yeah. Magnitude equals one. So this notation is going to have something to do with using vectors that are one unit long. Okay. What I'm going to show you first is two special unit vectors. Okay, the first one is called i. i has nothing to do with being imaginary. Okay? This is a bold i. It just means it's the vector i. When you're naming vectors, you would never use an i. Because i means something special. Okay? i is a unit vector that points one unit to the right. So if you want to name a vector, use a letter other than I. Use A, B, C, but don't use I because that, that's reserved for this. Okay, so what does it look like visually? Just like that. I is a unit vector long, a uh, unit vector, one unit long. It points to the right. Okay. The other special unit vector that you never want to use this to name a vector is the letter J. So j is another unit vector. It's one unit long, and it points up. And if you want to see a um, picture, 
what I just circled right there, that's what the vector j looks like. It's one unit long, and it points up. So the idea with unit vector notation is you take, you take the two vectors that you have, i and j, you can take multiple copies of them, and you stack them together. Okay? We're going to kind of take, think of i and j as like building blocks. We're going to stack them together to make vectors. Okay, the first time I'll do it visually so you can see it. After that, we're just going to use the notation, which is much faster than drawing it out. So you always think of i and j as like Lego blocks. We're going to stack them together to, to make things. Okay, so we're going to write the vector 3, 4 using unit vector notation. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just change the color so you can see these a little better. Okay, so I'm going to make um, I, that's the unit vector that's horizontal, I made it red, and I'm going to make J, the unit vector, green. Okay, so I'm going to start at the origin, and I know I'm going to end up at 3, 4. Right three, up four. I want to get there by stacking together i's and j's. Okay, so let's start with i. How many i's would I need to stack together to start to get me from the initial point to the terminal point? Three. I need three of them. So I'm going to make three copies. And I'm going to stack that one, make it a little bigger so you can maybe see the arrowhead. Two, three. Okay, so what I have right there is three i. So three i plus how many j's would I need to stack together? Four. I need four copies of j. And you stack them all together, just like we've, we've done before. One, two, three, four. So I just stacked four J's together. And that, that thing I just circled, that's how you write the vector 3, 4 as a unit using unit vector notation. 3i plus 4j. What does that really mean visually? You stack three i's together, and then you stack four j's together. And that's, that's the notation that we're going to use from now on. Any question on that? Yeah? You said it was like a negative three, it'd be like negative three i. Yeah, so if you just keep i and j positive, you might be like, well, i goes to the right and j goes up. Does that only mean that I can be in this area, positive, positive? No. Nope. You can flip i around and make it negative and you can go to the left, and you can make j negative, and you can go down. So, and you can have fractions. You could do one half i if you wanted, and just go half over. Um, the numbers in front of i and j can be any, any real numbers. Positives, negatives, fractions, decimals. So, what we say, kind of the fancy word for this, is i and j span, S-P-A-N, they span the plane, meaning you can put a dot anywhere you want, and I can somehow find a way to get there, stacking together i's and j's. If I didn't have um, j, what kind of movement would I be restricted to? Pretend j didn't exist. I would only be able to move. I'd only be able to move horizontally. So that would be work if I had like a number line. And all I had to do was move left and right. I would not be able to move up and down. Okay, so this is 2D, right? Horizontal and vertical. You need two vectors to go anywhere you want. What about 3D? How many vectors do you think you would need in 3D? Three. You would need three. Okay. Two vectors would allow you to move left and right, up and down, but the third vector would allow you to come out towards you or in towards the board would allow you to move in the third, the third axis. So 
So to span the plane, you need as many vectors as you have dimensions. That's basically it. Never mind. Any questions on that notation? So we'll practice using both the I's and J's and the um, angle brackets with the next few formulas. Okay, so in the formulas that I'm about to give you, V and W represent vectors. And alpha just represents a scalar. Okay, remember, a scalar is just a number, like 3, 5, negative 2. It's just a number that can make your vector longer, shorter, or flip. Okay, we talked about scale scaling yesterday. Okay, so there's my two vectors. Um, v has an x and a y value. W has an x and a y value. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is show you how to add these two vectors together um, numerically. We're not going to draw it. Okay, we did drawing yesterday. Does anyone have a guess what you would do if you wanted to add V and W together? What you would do with X1 and X2? Yep. Add them. You would add them. And together, X1 plus X2 would be your first number. And do the same for the y's. So to add two vectors together numerically, you just add the corresponding components, the x's and the y's. Okay, how about um, subtraction? You just subtract them. Take the x components, subtract them, and the y components. It's important here that you do it in the right order. Subtraction is not commutative. Okay, that means v minus w is not the same as w minus v. Okay, so just do it in the order that they tell you to. Okay, scaling. So scaling can do three things to a vector. Uh, does anyone remember the one thing that when you scale a vector can happen? Do you remember? Uh, scale. What does it mean to scale something? Make it bigger or smaller. So there's two of the three things. It can make it longer, it can make the vector shorter, and one other thing. Yep. It can put it in reverse direction if it's a negative. So to scale a vector, all you have to do is scale each component. So if you want to multiply vector v by a number, it's like almost distributing that number to each component. The way we would have done that before is, let's say you had vector v and you wanted to triple it, you would have stacked three of them together and then drawn the answer. Okay, now we're not doing it as a visual. And um, this symbol with the double bars around it, um, does anybody remember what, what that means? Yeah. If v was negative, it would still be the same. Um, these, uh, like it, it represents the magnitude. It, it's the magnitude. Yep, yeah. exactly. That symbol means magnitude. Now let's um, let's look at this. Okay. Wait, what was that again? This symbol? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even do it. It means magnitude. I haven't shown you the formula yet. Oh, that's fine. There's a formula under there, but you'll see it in a second. All right. Um, let's say we had this point and this point. And that's my vector. Okay, let's call it vector b. If I want to know the magnitude of b, basically means how long is that arrow? Well, we could do something here we've, we've done before to find the length of that. Um, anyone have a thought? I need to add a little bit to this picture to do it. Yeah? So you have to turn it into the right triangle to find the hypotenuse. Yeah. Just turn it into the right triangle. Two of the sides you should know because you have the initial and terminal point. So one, two, three, four, five, 
Bottom side is six, the height, one, two, three, four. And now once you know two out of three sides, how do you get the third side? Six squared plus four squared plus six. Right, Pythagorean theorem. So, like so seven point two one or something. I did it last night on my homework. That's oh, that's what it came out to. Yeah. So all we have to do is the Pythagorean theorem. Now, in general, you're not gonna know this number. You're not gonna know that number. They're just variables. So whatever they are, square the first one, square the second one, add them up and take the square root. That's the Pythagorean theorem. In our case, it would be six squared plus four squared, and then take the square root. Okay, any questions on those four formulas? Add, subtract, scale, magnitude. All right. So, uh, I'm giving you two vectors, V and W. And I want to do all four of those things, okay, using these two vectors. Um, we'll practice writing the answer in unit vector notation and with the angle brackets. Okay, you should, you should be comfortable writing in both ways because you'll probably see both on the test. Okay, so let's start with um, V plus W. All right, um, all right, so V plus W. Let's start by doing it with the um, angle brackets. Okay, so Myler, if I wanted to find V plus W, um, what would be the two numbers I would add up first? Two plus three. Yep, two plus three. And Casey, the next two? Uh, three and negative four. Three plus negative four. Okay, so that's gonna give me five, comma, negative one, if we write it with angle brackets. Uh, and Caitlin, can you write that for me as um, unit vector notation? So the unit vector will have the i's and j's in it. Would be five i um, plus negative one j plus. Yep, you could do five i plus negative one j, or if you're going to do plus a negative number, you could just think of it as minus. So five i minus, and she said she had a one in front of the j. If you want to put it, it's fine. Or we can just leave the one off and say five i minus j. If you don't put a one, I know that it's there just like with a variable. Okay. So those are both correct. Questions on that? That'd be the final answer. Mm -hmm. That's the final answer. Do you want us to uh, put it in the i and j form every time, or do you play this i and one? If the directions don't say, you can do either way. If the directions specify, then I want whatever the directions say. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to do both. I'm just showing you both. Um, let's look at V minus W. Um, so Ezekiel, can you tell me um, what I would subtract first to do V minus W? Three minus two. What, sorry, I can't hear what minus what? Two minus three. Yep, two minus three. And for the second set, for the vertical component, and what's going to happen when you do three minus minus four? It's going to become plus. Okay, so Ian, uh, my final answer there will be negative one seven. Negative one seven. Yep. So there's the answer with the angle brackets. Uh, and Matt, can you give that to me using unit vector notation? I don't know. Not sure? Yeah. Uh, negative i plus 7? Yeah, negative i. So we have one unit in the i direction, but it's negative. So negative i 
And then what did you say? Plus, plus seven. Seven jet. Seven jet. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. So you would stack an I going to the left, seven of the J's going up, and that's how you would build this vector. Okay, questions on that one? Both of these are what we call binary operations. Binary means you need two vectors to make it work. Right? If you want to add something, you have to have two things, or you can't do addition. With this, you only need one vector. Okay? We're scaling. So I'm ignoring vector w in this problem. I'm tripling vector v. So if I triple v, um, Dave, what would be the um, algebraic way to write that? Triple V. Triple V. Uh, two plus two. Oh. It'd be not lost. Not sure. You want to help them out? So you want to triple each comp each um, component. So basically, it's almost like distributive property. Maybe three and then parentheses. No. Um, you want to do that out. Yeah, the final answer. When you... um, 6i. 6i. Plus 9j. Plus 9j. Yep. So 6i. Plus 9j. Okay, just know that these i's and j's are supposed to be bold. Right. Or 6, 9. Two different ways of writing the same answer. Any questions on that? Uh, the last one, okay, magnitude. This is also an operation that you do not need a second vector. I'm ignoring W again for this problem. I just want to know the magnitude of V. Okay, so how long is it? All right. Um, can someone set up my equation for me to find the magnitude of V? Yep. Square root of x1 squared plus y1 squared. Yep. And what's x1 and y1 in this case? Um, x1 is 2 and y1 is 3. Yep. So 2 squared plus 3 squared. And that gives me the square root of 13. 9 plus 4, 13. Okay. As always with square roots, if you get a number you can reduce, like square root of 12, um, reduce it. You shouldn't have to worry about square roots in a fraction because this formula doesn't have fractions um, in it unless the original coord unless the original vector had fractions. Okay. But that's that's the magnitude. Okay. Any questions on that? Yes? So in the tennis kind of example, you give us the information on the top and you have like four brackets where you put the minus plus there could be a scalar or or just be like find the plus W of this. Yeah, it would be all separate problems. So this problem. would be four separate problems on the test. I probably won't give you the same vector and ask you to do four different things with it. I'll probably give you two vectors and say add them. I'll give you a different vector and ask you to scale it. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? Right. All right. So. Uh, just a reminder about what a unit vector is. So a unit vector is a vector that is one unit long. Okay, so sometimes what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to take a a vector that's not a unit vector and turn it into one. Meaning if it's too long, we're going to make it shorter. If it's too short, we're going to make it longer so that it's exactly one unit. Okay, let's, um, let's close as I can. I just drew marks representing one unit in each direction. Um, it's pretty close. 
and I put a circle. That's a circle of radius one. And hopefully this arrow will fit in there. And then it fits in there perfect. Okay, so there's my arrow. Okay, what I want to do is I want to look at this vector first. It's not a unit vector. It's too long. How do I know that? If it, if it was one unit long, it would fit inside that circle perfectly. So it's too big. Um, let's pretend that that vector was five units long. I want to know what would you have to scale it by to make it one unit long? Yeah? Five. Well, if you scale it by five, that would make it 25 units long. That would make it even longer. One fifth. One fifth. So there's two ways you can say that. You can say, well, we just di divided by five or scale by one fifth. What if the vector was eight units long? What would you scale it by to make it one unit? One eighth. One eighth. Again, there's two ways to say it. You divided by its length, we divided it by eight, or multiply by one eighth, same thing. So what if it was x units long? What would you scale it by in this case? 1 over x. So the key is, if you have a vector and you want to make it one unit long, you scale it by dividing it by its length, or multiply by 1 over its length. All right, so to find, a, to find a unit vector, if they give you one, what we're doing, I'm just explaining the goal, we're finding a new vector, it's going to point exactly the same way, it's just going to be longer or shorter to make it exactly one unit. And now I'll show you the formula, which you guys pretty much already um, figured out. So if you have, kind of do what you guys just said, and then I'll show you the, the final result. If you have a vector, and you want to make it one unit long, multiply by 1 over the length. That's how you would scale it. If it was 5, you multiply by 1 over 5. If it's 8, you multiply by 1 over 8. If the vector is v, 1 over the length of v, whatever, whatever it is, 5, 8, doesn't matter. So if you multiply that out, v times 1 is v, and then you're just left with divided by the magnitude in the bottom. Okay, so to convert anything into a unit vector, just take the vector and divide by its length. Any questions? We'll do an example. But any questions on the on the formula? Wait. Okay. Let's let's look at an example. Okay. So I'm going to give you the vector three i minus four j, and I want to find the unit vector for that. So it's going to point exactly the same way. It's just either going to be a longer or shorter version of that one. How long or short? Exactly one unit. Okay, so first of all, looking at 3i minus 4j, do you think that's longer than one unit or shorter? Well, let's find the length of it. So the first step to finding a unit vector is to find the magnitude. If it already is 1, then you're done. There's nothing to do. If it's not 1, then we'll plug into the formula. So magnitude of v is the square root of, and what would I put under the root? 3 squared. Yep. 
plus. Plus. Pythagorean theorem is always plus. The number might be negative that you're squaring, but that doesn't really make a difference because the negative is going to cancel out. Um, what's 3 squared plus negative 4 squared? Um, 25. 25. And the square root of 25 is 5. So, is V a unit vector? No, it's 5 times too long. So we actually already know what we're going to do. We're going to make it 5 times shorter. So, to find the unit vector, we're going to take our vector, which is 3i minus 4j, and we're going to divide it by, what's the magnitude we just found? 5. Now you can't leave it like that, you need to do it out. So divide the first component by 5, so you get 3 fifths i minus, and what's going to be the number in front of j? Four-fifths. So that is a scaled-down version of the original vector. It scaled it down by one-fifth the size. So did I change the direction? No. All I did was make it shorter. Five times shorter. Okay. And that's, that's how you find a unit vector, given a vector that's not a unit vector. Okay. Any questions on that? So, the last thing we're going to look at um, is a word problem. And we're going to look at the word problem that involves velocity. So, we can use vectors to represent the speed and direction of an object. Okay? And together, speed with direction, that's velocity. We're going to figure out what the formula is for a velocity vector, and then once we know the formula, we're going to use it um, to solve a problem. Now, for the purpose of modeling this, we're going to assume that when we throw an object, it travels in a straight line. It's not really true. Okay? When you throw an object, gravity is always pulling it back down, so things travel more in like an arc motion. Um, but we're trying to simplify it, so let's pretend we're doing this in an environment where there's no gravity, there's no wind resistance. So when you throw an object, it just keeps going straight. It doesn't, doesn't come back down. All right, so what I want to do is figure out two things about this vector. I want to figure out the angle. Let me just make sure that's how I name the angle in the formula. Uh, do I use that or alpha? Alpha. It doesn't really matter what you name the angle. Just call it something. I'll call it alpha because that's what I'm going to call it in formula. And I'm going to make a triangle out of this. Okay. So what I really have here is separating my vector into components. If this arrow represented a, like a ball traveling, what do, how many directions is the ball traveling in? One, two. Well, yeah, it's traveling. What two ways is the ball moving? Oh. It's moving up, but it's also moving to the right. So it's moving in two directions. It's moving right, and that's a visual representation of the vector that would represent right and it's moving up. That's a visual representation of the, the up part. All right, so if we called, I just want to use the same letters. Okay. So let's call this one, um, let's call this side x and this side y. So together, if you stack vectors x and y together, it creates vector v. There's a horizontal part, 
and there's a vertical part. Okay, and this is a right. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so now I want to come up with a formula for x. Okay? And I want it to have to do with this angle and this side. We're going to do y after, but let's just start with x. What is, the, what is the name of the side that I've labeled x from the perspective of alpha? Adjacent. It's adjacent. It's right next to it. And what's the name of the side that's v? Hypotenuse. What trig function has adjacent and hypotenuse in it? Cosine. cosine. So the cosine of my angle equals adjacent over hypotenuse. But what is it about the adjacent? Not is it like the color of the adjacent side, how heavy the adjacent side is? What about the magnitude, right? It's the length of the adjacent side. Because we're talking about lengths when we use sine. Length of the adjacent divided by length of the hypotenuse. And now I want to put that on the other side. So how would I move the magnitude of V to the other side? Multiply. I would multiply. So magnitude of V cosine alpha equals the magnitude of X. Okay, that's our first formula. That's for x. Now we're going to do the same thing for y. So this time we're going to use alpha, v, and y. Um, we know that v is hypotenuse. What's y? Opposite. Opposite. So now I want to think of a trig function that would involve opposite and hypotenuse. So sine. So we're going to set it up again. Sine is Opposite over hypotenuse, but what is it again? What about the opposite? Well, it's the length, right? It's magnitude. Length of the opposite divided by length of the hypotenuse. And do the same thing again. Get, get the V on the other side by multiplying. And now we have a formula for Y. Um, so magnitude of E sine alpha okay. and now we can create our formula using what's in box one and what's in box two so um, the formula is going to be well What's in box one represents the horizontal. What's in box two represents y, it's the vertical. You have to ask, stack them together to get the combined result. So uh, the final formula would be magnitude of v cosine alpha and that number is going to go in front of the, the, um, the i. That's your horizontal. Okay, you've got to put the I there so somebody knows, oh, that's that's the horizontal. Plus magnitude of V sine alpha. And what's that? That's the J component. That's the up and down. That's the vertical. Now if you look at each part, what do they both have in common? in front of the trig function? Magnitude. Magnitude of V. So instead of writing the same thing twice, we can pull it out and just write it once. And that's how you get this result. So it's the magnitude of V times cosine alpha, that's the I component, plus sine of alpha, and that's the J component. If you want to leave it distributed out, you can write it this way too. That's fine. It's the same, same formula either way. 
Okay, so to use this formula, there's two things you need to know about your object being thrown. One, you have to know the angle the object is being thrown at. Okay, did the person throw the object at a 30 degree angle, 20 degree angle, 90 degree angle, straight up? And the other thing we need to know is how fast did they throw it? Did they throw it at 50 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour? Okay, how fast is it being thrown? As long as you know these two things, you just fill them into the formula up above and then do it out with the calculator. Okay, so any questions on the formula? So just looking at it might seem kind of weird, but really it's just a right triangle using sine and cosine to break it into the horizontal and the vertical. All right, so let's see if we can use it. Uh, so it says that we're throwing an object at 50 miles an hour at an angle of 30 degrees. Find the velocity vector. So that's what's in the red box. And then explain it. I want you to explain what the answer means to me. Okay. So the first thing I need is the magnitude of Either make the V bold or put an arrow above it, it doesn't matter. What's the magnitude of my throw here? How fast am I throwing the object? 50 miles per hour. Second thing I need to know is the angle that I'm throwing it at. What's the angle? 30 degrees. Nothing's going to happen to that I, it's just going to stay there. And when you write your final answer, it's going to be a number with I plus a number with J. We have to do it up. Um, plus sine 30, J. Okay, so let's do it up. So that's why I said if you leave it distributed, that's fine. Um, because you're going to have to distribute it when you write it out in the final answer anyway. All right, um, okay, before I type anything in, what should I um, double check? Degrees. Yep, I need to make sure I'm in degrees. Okay, all of these pro types of problems will be in degrees. So 15 cosine 30. Okay, I get 43.30. And that's the horizontal. It's I, and sine of 30, uh, and distribute the 50 to that. And you get um, 25. Okay, so 25. Okay, so that's the first part. So we have the velocity vector. Now, how many different directions did we say earlier that this object if you throw something like that, is moving it? Two. So what that means is this object really has two different speeds, depending on how you look at it. If you were standing in front of the object, and it was coming straight at you, and you pointed a radar gun at it, it would say it's coming at you at 43.3 miles per hour. It wouldn't be coming at you at 50, because it wasn't thrown straight at you. It was thrown up at an angle. So part of that 50 mile per hour is going into moving it forward. The other part is going into moving it up. So if you were up above the object being thrown, like you're in like a helicopter, and you pointed a radar gun down at the ball, it would say the ball is coming up at the helicopter at 25 miles per hour. So it would be coming up at 25 and going towards you at 43.3. Another way to think of it is if you threw this object and it hit a wall, it would hit the wall at 43 miles per hour, assuming it didn't hit a ceiling first. Okay. Um, that's basically the speed. 43.3, um, does that speed ever change? Let's assume there was no air resistance. No. The second that ball leaves your hand, if there's no air resistance, it's traveling 43.3 horizontally the whole time. How about the vertical speed? Does that change? 
because of gravity, it does. The second it leaves your hand, it's going 25 miles per hour. Once it's out of your hand, it's slowing down. That's why it hits the highest point and it comes back down. If it never slowed down, it would just keep going. Okay. So to explain it, this is the speed um, in the horizontal direction. That's the speed in the vertical direction. Knowing those two speeds, we can figure out all kinds of things. Based on the gravity of Earth, I can tell you how high that ball is going to go. Um, I can tell you how far it's going to go before it hits the ground. So maybe if you're throwing an object and you want to make sure it clears a certain distance or it has to go over a wall or a fence, or if it's like a missile trying to hit a target, you've got to make sure that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. So knowing those two speeds would help you do that. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so that's part two. Okay, so homework tonight, um, it's the same packet as last night, 344. Um, tonight, 25 to 47 odd, 57 and 55. Okay, we'll go over that the next time we have class. And then after that, we'll be using the second packet for the rest of the week.